And it's a joy to stand before you today as always. And it's, if I haven't told you lately, it's just a joy to be the preacher for the Valley View Church of Christ. And all the encouragement and, and the, the attentiveness that you give to the lessons, is a, it's, it's greatly appreciated. And I love you for it. You know, being a preacher is a, is a great blessing. I've heard it said, and, and I would echo this. If I had a thousand lives to live, I'd be a preacher in every one of them. But sometimes it's trying, particularly when it comes to humor. People love to make preacher jokes. In fact, I think that we probably get the second most behind lawyers jokes made about our profession. Just the other day, I giggled a little bit when someone told me about a farmer who invited the preacher over for Sunday chicken dinner. They enjoyed that fried chicken together and the Making small talk, the preacher looked out the window and saw the rooster walking around in the yard. He said, boy, that is one proud rooster you have there. He's got his chest puffed out. He's walking around like he owns the place. He is one proud, proud rooster. And the sly farmer said, well, he ought to be. His oldest son just entered the ministry. Now think about that for a minute. So we get a lot of those kind of jokes. But let me tell you who else gets a lot of them. I guess number three behind behind um, lawyers and preachers would be deacons. I've heard a lot of deacon jokes through the years. We like to tease them because they're an easy target, right? I mean, they're always around doing something or telling us, you know, it's time to go and lock up the building or we got to turn the lights off. Or, in fact, when it comes to turning the lights off, I heard just the other day someone talking about two Ladies talking in the hallway about a brother who was always insistent on saving money and getting the lights turned off at church. And one of the sweet sisters replied, well, I'm, I'm worried about it because if he dies and sees the light at the end of the tunnel, how do we know he won't turn it off? You know, those are the kind of things we say about them because that's what they do. They serve. They do all the, the, the tasks that nobody else is either wants to do or is willing to do. And we're about to enter into a deacon selection process. So the elders have asked that I address the subject of who a deacon is, what his work entails, and what his character should be. In essence, what is the role of a deacon within the body of Christ? And then when we're done this morning, there'll be handout sheets that Brother Terry and myself will have at the back while you leave. As you leave, you can take one of those. And we have specific areas where we need deacons, not just in general this time, but specific areas where we desperately need some help. And we're going to ask you to go to those folks, make sure they're willing to serve, and then, and then put down their names. But we wanted to talk a little bit about who he is, what his role is, what kind of man we need to choose for our deacons, our servants in the church. Now the word deacon is simply from the Greek word diakonos which is one of the two words along with the Greek word doulos, which is translated servant in Scripture. Now one is translated more servant, and the other one is often translated slave, but they still have the same idea, the same concept. Because in the first century world, those two were somewhat interchangeable. One was a bond servant, the other one was one who was under mandatory compulsion to serve, but still they had the same component, the same essence, one who serves another, a doulos and a diakonos. So from that, we get the word deacon in English. Now, someone might say, well, isn't everybody a deacon? Because we're all told to be servants. We're all a diakonos in that sense. And, and there, in a way, that's true because we would say everyone shepherds one another, right? I mean, we all hopefully are trying to be an encouragement and trying to look out for one another's soul, but we wouldn't say that everyone in the church is a shepherd. So yes, it is a role, a job, that identifies the particular task or the particular person or office, if you will, in the church, but that even though we all partake in that somewhat, we're not all elders, we're not all shepherds. We would say that everybody in the church ministers. We like to use the word minister. Probably the more biblical word, and there's a lot of discussion about which is the best word for a preacher. Pastor is used 
in a lot of the religious world. Reverend is used at times. That one always made me uncomfortable more than any of the rest because a reverend, I mean, that means to be revered. And I just, uh, I don't know how anyone would feel comfortable being called the revered one. But then the, other, the, the only time I've ever been called that is I did the prayer for the Alabama Assembly and they put on their certificate, they sent me the Reverend Kerry Williams. So the state of Alabama thinks I'm a reverend, but I promise you that is absolutely not the case because we should revere any man. But when it comes to what we call shepherds, they're shepherds and pastors, what we call preachers, the best word probably in scripture is an evangelist. Now we all are evangelists, aren't we? Isn't it the role of every single believer to be one who shares the gospel with their neighbors, with their friends? To be a participant in the evangelistic process of the church? But we're not all in the role of an evangelist, with the title, with the office of an evangelist. Likewise, it is true that every Christian is to be a servant. But yet there is an office, there is a role of a special servant of a deacon that the scripture describes who is to be a particular person for a particular task. So as we start our discussion, we turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. This is what we typically call the qualifications of a deacon. And it's a long list, a laundry list, if you will, of what you're looking for when the church is trying to select what men will serve as deacons within the body of Christ. And what's, I think, interesting about this is it follows directly after the qualifications of an elder, that long list that's listed there. And I've wondered often if perhaps we haven't looked at these listings in the proper manner. Let's read it together. Starting verse 8. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding to the mystery of the faith and with a pure conscience. But let them also be first then proved and let them serve as deacons being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. And let deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own household well. For those who have served well as a deacon obtain for themselves a good standing with great boldness in the faith in the faith which is Christ Jesus. Now, how this is sometimes interpreted or applied is there's a, 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 a look, a, an examination, if you will, of every single one of these qualities. And the church will measure a person against the ultimate extreme of each quality. Now, I've seen it even more when it comes to selecting an elder. In other words, is he absolutely this? Is he absolutely this? Does he have this quality in its extreme measure? Well, it's a long list of qualities. The problem, I think, with that approach to these qualifications, and do not misunderstand, let me make this perfectly clear. I think men need to be qualified to serve as both elders and deacons. Wouldn't we all agree? That they need to meet these qualifications. That's not the question. The question is, what does it mean to meet these qualifications? Is it meant to be a checklist where you walk down through, okay, does he have this in the most extreme measure that a person could check? For instance, one of the ones when it comes to an elder, is he supposed to be hospitable? What does it mean to be hospitable? I mean, does that mean to have people into your home once a year? Well, to some people, that's not very hospitable. How about once a quarter? How about once a month? What if they have the same people over? Does that count as being hospitable? What if they have different people over? Is that hospitable? You see what I mean? How do we define exactly what that means? Then you look here at one of the qualifications of a deacon is to rule over his children well. What does that mean? I mean, does he have control in his home? You can kind of judge that some. But does everybody who has control at times not have control? Well, yeah. I mean, they're kids. They're ornery and they're loud and they have different personalities. So does the fella who has two meek and mild little children who just would never squeak a peep, 
Is he more qualified than the guy who's got like Kerry Williams kids that are loudmouths, you know? Does it make that person less qualified than the other? Because it's a little easier for one to control his kids than the other. You see what I mean? How do we determine these things? Let me suggest. Imagine that you're going to the car lot and you're buying you a new car. Doesn't everybody want the best car you can buy when you do that? I mean, the payments are high, right? I mean, the insurance is high. You want the best ride that you can get. Has everybody done that? Everybody's bought a car, right? We don't live in New York with a subway system. Everybody in here has bought a car. Well, let's imagine that you have a list like this. I want horsepower. And let's say you apply the same kind of matrix to this. I want the most horsepower. And I want fuel economy. I want the most fuel economy. And I want sleek. I want the most sleek. And I want comfortable. And I want to ride well. Here's your problem. Has anybody ever bought that car? No, honestly, have you bought the car with the most horsepower, the best ride, the sleekest body, and the best fuel economy? Does anyone own that car? Do you know why you don't? Because it doesn't exist. Even if you were to buy a Rolls Royce or a Bentley and spend a half a million dollars, you're not going to get all those things. Because the car with the most horsepower, I just love a Corvette, but let me tell you, you're going to be a little bit lacking in some of the others, aren't you? Now it's sleek. You're going to get the horsepower, you're going to get the sleek, but you ain't going to get the ride. Have you ever ridden in one before? Like a lumber wagon. You know what I mean? Just boom, 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 boom. And what about the fuel economy? You going to get that? No, no, no. So let's go with fuel economy. Then you get one of those little smart cars. You know those little things? They get 65 miles to the gallon. But you don't get any sleep with one of them babies. And let me tell you, my dog could run on a wheel and give you more horsepower, right? It's not going to give you that. My point is, is that when you go, you look for something that has some measure of all of these things, don't you? You look for a car that has adequate horsepower and one that's reasonably comfortable and one that has decent fuel economy and it looks pretty good because you're never going to find an automobile that has all the most extreme of every quality how on earth have we ever expected to ever have leaders would we expect them to have the most horsepower the sleekest ride the best fuel economy because if it ain't true with cars, folks, you know it ain't true with people. What this text is trying to describe is a person of character, right? Because, you know, when you go to the lot and you find that car that's got pretty good horsepower and it's a pretty nice ride and it's got good fuel economy and you see an adequate amount of all of those things in this automobile, you know what you say about that? That's a quality automobile. Oh, it's not got the most horsepower, it's not a Corvette. But that's a quality automobile. Oh, it doesn't get 65 miles to get to the gallon, but it gets pretty good. That's a quality automobile. You know what we need to be looking for? We need to be looking for people who are quality people. Right? Amen. Good. Who are people of character. Who have an adequate measure of all of this. Now, maybe they won't be the most at one or the other, but they have an adequate measure. They're people who exemplify the word character. I read a quote one time about character. It said, character is this. Heavy weights are hung on the thin wires of reputation. A person of character is a person whose reputation, all those weights of, are hung upon a good reputation that can hold up all the pressure. When I look at the Greek word for character, as it's described in Scripture, in the Greek, it's the same word they would use when describing an engraver. You know, someone who engraves on metal or stone, and who takes that engraver's tool and etches wording into the wood, into the 
metal into the stone. Mm -hmm. This is a person of character who has had good things etched in his life, in his personhood. It, a good example of this is if you were to look into the person who invented, back in the 1800s, who invented dynamite. You know, that was the precursor to all explosives. And it was used for everything from building railroads to, to mining to, you know, even the more nefarious war type of activities. But the fellow who created dynamite, he had a brother. And some, his brother had passed away. And the newspaper, because his brother wasn't famous, and he was, the newspaper made a mistake and printed his obituary rather than his brother's. And he wasn't dead. So he literally, like some of you tease, you know, when I say, what are you reading the paper? What are you looking for? I'm just making sure I'm not in the obituaries today. Well, he literally found himself in the obituaries, still alive. And it broke his heart. Because it said, Dynamite King has died. The merchant of death has left this world. That's what it said. And it broke his heart. So he decided, he said, I will not be remembered for the things that I've made. Even though they've made me wealthy, even though they've made contributions, I don't want to be remembered forevermore as the merchant of death, as the dynamite king. When people say my name, I don't want them to think dynamite. And you know you don't. You know what his name was? Alfred Nobel. When you hear the word Nobel, what do you think of? The Nobel Peace Prize. Because from that day forward, he, through philanthropy, he decided, I want to be remembered for good things. And so when I tell you dynamite, you know what that is. But when we use the word Nobel, nobody thinks of war. You think of peace. Nobody thinks of destruction. You think of creation and making things that are helpful to society. That's the idea behind character. A person who says, I want to do things that are good, that contribute, that help. So when we're looking at this list, and we look out among ourselves for men qualifying to be deacons, we're not looking for absolute horsepower. We're not looking for absolute fuel economy. We're looking for someone who has a good measure of all these qualities who is a person of character, who just like we'd say, that's a good car. We said, that's a good man. That's a good man. <clears throat> the second thing we examine is not only who he is, but we ask what it is that he does. Deacon comes from the word, as we mentioned before, one who serves. And this encompasses his work. It is the very identifier. A deacon must be a servant. A deacon must be a doer because servants are doers. They're not just planners. They're not just ones who, with cerebral effort, work to work it all out. They're the ones who actually do the work. Deacons must be people who are willing to serve, who are willing, if, you, if we are to use the, the, the expression, get their hands dirty. All Christians are to be involved in service, but these voluntary servants, if they were not here, things would inevitably be left undone. I can tell you that's true. We have been, and I don't think he had the title of a deacon, but he certainly performed the work of a servant. Brother Bill Payton's passing has left us a little bit in a lurch because we've been trying to figure out, I mean, how do we get all the things that we didn't even realize he did? We didn't even know how to run the air conditioner or something. We didn't even know how to, how do I get those lights on? How do I, which doors? Oh, we forgot that door. We forgot this door. Because there are things that we didn't even realize that were being done. Because that's the nature of a true servant. One who is willing to take initiative and do what would be left undone if someone didn't step up. Thus we have this special servant who's chosen to serve in a specific ministry so that nothing would be overlooked. Now it's not a specific example of deacons per se, but Acts chapter 6 
is certainly a helpful passage. The reason we don't use this to apply it specifically to the, to the role of a deacon is this came far previous to the inspired account of different roles and offices within the church. But still it serves as somewhat of a, a vague model. We see in chapter 6 in the early days of the church, now in those days when the number of disciples was multiplying, there was a murmuring against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected for daily distribution. So the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, Is it not desirable that we should leave the word of God to serve tables? Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation. Remember, good men. Of good quality. Of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, who you may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So this serves as somewhat of a vague model for us of how we select, how we choose men over a specific work. Now this is a specific work. The work of ministering to these widows. They weren't being appointed in general apostles because they wouldn't have been qualified to be apostles. But they already had apostles who were doing the work of apostles. They weren't being appointed as elders and leaders in the church. They were being appointed to this specific task. So this specific task would not be left undone. The third thing we ask, and this helps us to define the role of a deacon, is what he is not. Now this has been misunderstood. I remember in one place where I was privileged to labor, uh, one of the elders and myself, we, we would see this a little differently. He would always talk about when we were going through elder selection. Well, you know, a man needs to be a deacon before he's an elder. Do you find that anywhere in Scripture? No. In fact, it's a little bit of a strange concept because a deacon is a totally different role with a totally different responsibility than an elder. The idea that an that a elder, because an elder is an authoritative office, and we understand that. The shepherds, they're the ones who shepherd the church. That means the shepherd decides where the flock goes. The shepherd protects the flock. The shepherd leads the flock. The shepherd disciplines the flock. That is the role undisputed of the shepherds. But what about the deacons? You know, there's nowhere in Scripture that you will find, once the role of deacon is established by the Holy Spirit and the New Testament writers, it to be an authoritative position. And I've heard us describe it, and I understand why we do, because in our American context, we think of everything in uh, command structures, right? You know, you got the general, then you got the colonel, then you got the major, then you got the captain, then you got lieutenants, and then you enlisted men underneath that. And in corporations, you have the CEO, and then you've got the president, and you've got the vice president, then you've got the CFO, and you've got the, and everything's in all these structures. So in the church, we just assume, well, if there's a special office, then you've got the elder, and then you've got the deacons, then you've got the members, and at the very bottom, you've got the preacher. You know, I'm just teasing. But, you know, we think of things in those command structures. Biblically speaking, that's not necessarily how it works. There's never a time in Scripture when you see the deacons gathering together to make a major decision for the people of God. No, no, no. They're too busy to do that. They're off setting up the tables. And they're off taking care of the widows. And they're off turning on and off the lights. Well, they didn't literally have to. I guess they had to light the lanterns and, and douse those out at night. You see, they were doing the work of the church. But yet, in our Americanism, we make it into something that will fit into this corporate structure. We make it into a position of authority. The elders have the authority of oversight. The evangelist has the authority of the word. But the deacon's place is one of service. Which truly is a great work. And folks, we must never act like. We must never assume. We must never even allow the hint of a thought to enter our minds. That being a servant is in any way less than any other role. Because I look back to the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 20. In verse 25 where he says, Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. And those who were great exercised authority over them. 
yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to be great among you will be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to serve, and to give His life as a ransom for many. I think it, it, perhaps in no other way, way is the character of Christ more expressed in the church than through the role of a deacon. Who day in and day out, often without a lot of praise, often without a lot of recognition, He just serves. And he serves and he serves. Even in the shadows, even when nobody sees. Just like Jesus <coughs> serves. <clears throat> what a needed and useful work a deacon has. This morning you'll be given the opportunity to nominate some men for the role of a deacon. Think about his character. Think about the work. Think about the specific tasks where we need men. Think about what it means to have men who are willing to serve. If you're subject to an invitation this morning, if you need to work on your service in your life, if you need to give your life to Jesus, whatever your need may be, don't delay. Come right now as we stand, as we stand.